A very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's exciting webinar hosted by Comarc and organized by MS Events. I'm Shuchita Gupta, the Portfolio Director with MS Events. We are very excited to have you all join us at this webinar. The corporate banking function has undergone massive transformation. Corporates and medium-sized businesses are one of the most demanding clientels, requiring reliable, flexible, cost-effective, as well as an end-to-end -end platform that can cover all their business needs in the most seamless way possible. In this interactive webinar, we will deep dive into trends, insights, and hear success stories on how to transform corporate banking in today's landscapes that banks find themselves in. Today, we will have discussions around the trends in corporate bankings, where we'll have the regional leaders in this sector from Commercial Bank of Dubai, National Bank of Oman, Mashrek Bank, and Comarque share their insights. Before I mute myself and introduce Akshay to you, please let me remind you of a few pointers. You can always use the chat and questions tab to write down the questions or use the time allotted towards the end of the discussion to ask them. There will be some exciting poll questions coming your way during the webinar, so please make sure you share your responses and keep it interactive. Post the discussion, you will receive a link which will direct you to a survey and on-demand recording of the discussion with details from Comarque. If you wish to know more of what Comarque offers, you can reach out to Monica. She's the Business Development Manager, Finance, Banking and Insurance with Comarque. Now, without any further ado, I would like to leave the stage for Akshay Dasani, your moderator, who has been a seasoned senior corporate banker with banks such as Douche Bank, Mashrek, National Bank of Fijera, and Emirates NBD, and currently is an advisor to corporates and FLS. Over to you, Akshay. Welcome, everybody. I do believe that uh, COVID is not yet behind us. Although humanity, I think, is a bit ahead today, but we still have to follow the protocols like social distancing and hence this webinar. However, we as bankers are no, are no strangers to social distancing. Every RM, he or she knows that after they lend money and they make the first call to recover a past due TR or uh, an overdue loan, how the social distancing increases between the bank and the customer. It's incredible, isn't it? Today, we have with us an amazing line of panelists. Their combined experience is more than half a century. So do listen in to what they have to say. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce them one by one. Um, first is Mr. Anshuman Shankar. Uh, Anshuman, if you could. Uh, uh, Anshuman is the head of corporate banking and of the manufacturing division as well at uh, Commercial Bank of Dubai. He is also an ex city banker. We have Mr. Neeraj Kumar, who is the head of corporate banking for UAE at National Bank of Oman. Neeraj is ex HSBC. And we have Mr. Karthik Taneja, who is the executive vice president and head of payments at Mashrak and uh, Karthik is also ex Standard Chartered Bank. We have Mr. Mathieu Salata, who is the Consulting Director at Comarc. And as you know, Comarc started way back in 1993, providing software innovative solutions to various banks and FIs. Uh, with that intro, uh, let me delve straight away into the webinar. My first question is, uh, and this can be taken up by both Anshu and Neeraj, uh, there are over 50 banks in the UAE. So how does a corporate bank differentiate itself to its uh, customers, other than pricing, that is? I think uh, I will go first. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Akshay. And I think you've set the tone right for this webinar. Uh, we are at a point where, yes, uh, the markets are opening up. Uh, the pandemic is largely behind us. But again, it's a very important time also to take stock of some key situations and some key developments in the market. To your point, uh, definitely, I think 50 banks uh, uh, suggest that we are an overbanked state. And I think uh, the journey over the last five years in this space would also hint at a lot of consolidation, which has already taken place. But having said that, uh, pricing, yes, is one of the key components. But I think when the corporates we deal with, they are actually looking at the entire package. And pricing definitely is one of them. I think within that package, it's also about uh, a long-term commitment, which an institution brings to the table. And that's very, very important. Uh, today, we are 
when you talk of 50 banks there are foreign banks there are local banks there are various banks which are just boutique outfits i think it's very important that the clients look at banks which can give a sort of a long term commitment uh, and become a part of their true uh, you know journey going forward also i think uh, it's your credit appetite as well because again uh, we have seen a lot of cycles in the last uh, i would say 15 years uh, which i have as you know uh, spent in this market uh, i think credit appetite for the banks is very very critical for not just the regions but also certain uh, industry uh, segments and this is what i think clients are also looking forward to and last but not least i think it's it's the turnaround times and some of this uh, digitization progress which is now happening um, today anybody is paying a price for the service which, which they want in return so for me i think the real differentiator going forward will definitely not be only pricing i think it would be a package comprising your service standards your digitization fluency and some of the other stuff including uh, credit appetite okay neeraj hi uh, thanks akshay thanks for the introduction so as yes, just building upon what uh, uh, was just mentioned right if we look at the the market dynamics right and over the last 10 15 years the the cycle has become shortened now and that's why you know the 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 cfo's role is much more complex today than what it was a, a decade back uh, look at look at you know the, how how they think of the banks right now as you mentioned it is a overcrowded bank and pricing is one of the determinant but from a company's perspective again and depending on the market segment what really differentiate is is not just the pricing but uh, what was just mentioned or proposition which the bank uh, brings to the the client and how strategic they are and how consistent they are in terms of relationship uh, you know approach and that's where the credit appetite the understanding of the sector nuances all these things are very important and also if you look at from a you know perspective of a client they are not looking at tactical relationship these days with the bank which kind of brings and, and brings cheap money but also looks at how they can be a partner in the long term growth and that's that's where the the dig, uh, digital proposition of the bank is very important and and, uh, uh, and and that's where i i would say the differentiation factor one of the other th factors are also the the footprints which can be important factor for international clients and and the onboarding process of of the of the clients so these are the factors which the companies look at uh, how they can differentiate between their relationship banks so what in uh, your opinion uh, and um, uh, karthik could jump in as well uh, has been the key innovations in the corporate banking arena let's say in the last 5 years shall i okay so oh, sure. so if 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 we look at you know the retail banking space obviously there has been a very strong uh, growth which has happened the innovation Uh, corporate banking in the region has been a bit slow uh, most of the innovations have been around the cash and trade business which is which is the key from a treasury function uh, customers are not just looking at the electronic banking channel uh, which was if, if you look at was more of electronic data sharing but look at the digital solution which is which is uh, probably much more enhanced proposition for a customer to to look at so i think the the innovations have been around cash and trade uh, which is which is key trade in terms of how we can turn around uh, improve the turnaround time uh, that's crucial you, you you have seen how most of the local banks they have also kind of uh, done the blockchain transactions so 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 these these are things which has happened on the the corporate banking side so that brings me to uh, uh, to karthik because you know every banker or corporate banker loves to monitor end use of funds and one of the biggest uh, uh, trans or the, the key transactions are very often uh, payments whether they be suppliers uh, employees what have you uh, karthik what do you see are the innovation that have happened on on, on the payment side um if it's okay i just want to also just weigh in on the previous one and i think maybe one of the pieces that we should think about is uh, you know in terms of structures and uh, depending you know especially the large size clients i think there has been a fair bit of innovation in in terms of how funding is structured rather than the traditional revolver or you know working capital kind of facilities i think there are now innovative ways you know deals are structured uh, more than what they were in the past when it comes to payments per se i think uh 
payments is one space which has been just um, on a tear when it comes to innovation. But I just want to talk about one aspect of it, which is the fact that if you look at the confluence of uh, retail payments and corporate payments, I think on the one hand, corporates are talking to us and saying, you know, I want you to bank my ecosystem. I want you to extend credit to my ecosystem. I mean, depending on the type of client, obviously. So some of those guys are asking us where we end up having a partnership, at least within the, you know, SME segment or mid market, if you want to call that and the larger clients. And sometimes going down to as low as, you know, personal loans for, you know, the ecosystem that they have. So as an example, in my past life uh, with Alibaba, you know, um, my, my previous bank was uh, also funding the large corporates through the, you know, LEC type uh, relationships and the really small uh, merchants through even personal loans, right? So that becomes a solution that the client wants. The other piece is, if you look at payables and receivables, I think... Um, a lot of clients are looking at, especially from a uh, receivables perspective, if you think about it, the market is maturing to a point where I feel at least uh, very strongly that there is the emergence of this, this universal switch that we, we probably want to think about, right? Where you, you have um, you know, money that can be accepted through not just cards, but wallets, through other new payment methods, right? through um, you know, FX and so on. There are multiple channels in that and optimizing some of that is, is an important piece. And the traditional ways that we are you know, getting receivables, which is checks and clearing and so on. Because all of these are becoming more important and clients are trying to optimize that and making sure that they're reconciling it at a, you know, at a more holistic level than they were doing in the past. Interesting. Um... So, you know, that actually uh, uh, is the right platform for someone like uh, uh, Salata to come in, uh, you know, with so much digitization and advances on artificial intelligence, uh, Neeraj mentioned blockchain. I wonder what has been the impact on the user experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, I hear consistently of unified portals at some of the banks. Um, how pivotal is that? Yes, so definitely. When we, we were talking about uh, relationships in corporate banking, and uh, this is something definitely that can be augmented by digital channels. So digital channels are not here to replace the whole interaction between DRM and the corporate clients. Digital channels are here to actually help those RMs to, to work with those clients to find the solutions to their problems. So Yes, you mentioned about portals, and this is actually a trend that we have been seeing all over Europe and now also in Southeast Asia, and I think it will be coming to Middle East as well, where the banks that are serving corporate customers, they want to provide those fully digital product life cycles for all kinds of products, but not using separate platforms, but using just one single portal, so that the clients, they can manage all of those different product, products via a unified interface. So they can have journeys that span multiple products. Like for example, traditionally, if you wanted to, let's say, pay for a letter of credit when it was due, you had to log into your FX platform, you had to exchange money, then you would probably move to the cash management where you would initiate the transaction. Now, it's all about unification now. So the banks are realizing that what they want to provide are those contextual journeys. Like for example, if I want to pay a letter of credit, I want the FX rate negotiation to be part of the process. I want the exchange to be seamless. So this is about providing this unifying experience and most successful banks like ING, like BNP, Pire, Paribas, they have already realized that, that they want to be where the clients are and not along the spots along the way, but through the whole journey. So they want to be there for them uh, throughout the whole throughout the whole thing and this actually brings me to to the next point when we are talking about digital chains augmenting the the way that the relationship managers work with the corporate clients there is also this bit of agility that needs to be in place for example let's say your corporate client wants to have a syndicated loan which is a very complex product now traditionally you would have to exchange a lot of paper a lot of documents to be able to provide such an offering and digital platforms, they have, they have enabled us to actually, first of all, have those processes digitalized, even the complex ones, with the ability to modify those, those processes, to tailor them to specific corporate customers. And secondly, to enable this more effective exchange, 
through digital digital channels, which is uh, crucial when we are talking about the times uh, that we're experiencing now, when the personal contact is not that common anymore. So I think, yes, the, the portals are pivotal and the digital channels, they are here to augment the, the relationships between the banks and the corporate customers. So interesting, in, in your experience, because you've been dealing with a lot of banks, I learned over 100 banks, mm -hmm. or you've been dealing with a lot of banks. Do you think how important it is for the customer to be ready? Uh, because if a bank suddenly takes leaps into digitization and if the customer base is not really keeping pace, have you experienced that kind of a gap or a friction, particularly yeah, yeah. in the Middle Eastern environment? Of course, yes. Yeah. So this is actually, this is pretty common, right? Because in corporate banking, uh, things move at a slower pace, just as, as it has been said, right? In retail customers, they are more willing to take risks. They are more willing to adapt to some new new developments. In corporate banking, it's a little slower because of the decision cycles and so on. And, but uh, what we see that the banks that uh, want to keep their relationship with the, their, their corporate clients is that they are helping them in adopting of those digital channels. Like for example, let's take host to host APIs, right? This is something that is uh, that has been an innovation through, throughout the last 10 years. And more and more corporate clients want to have this real time information about liquidity, which they can get through APIs. And this was, this was a difficult thing for, for many of the corporations because they didn't have like specialized IT departments that were able to provide the necessary security for the, for the connection to the APIs and so on. And what we see are banks actually helping those clients to adapt those solutions and in this way to even strengthen the relationship. So the banks are providing programs, they are sending their, their RMs, they are sending their IT teams on site so they can smoothen the transition to, to the newer digital ways of working. And this is something that uh, I think will be coming to the Middle East very soon. Yeah, I want. I just want to say add to this. You know, uh, I think it's 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 a dance, right, between the client and the bank in some sense. So someone has to lead. Uh, and yes, you're right. I think some uh, some clients are faster to follow, and some clients are not. And we have to make sure. And sometimes we don't. And I, you know, I'll I'll cop to that. That you know, we we can't always just wait for the clients to you know be ready for it equally we have to make sure that we help them on the journey for that excellent yeah so this, uh, it's, it's actually, more like a partnership right yeah yeah just to kind of build on you know what uh, karthik was mentioning right if you look at the middle eastern landscape especially on the large corporate side what we have seen is especially take the example of say cash management right now 10 years back it was more of an electronic delivery channel Last five or six years, all these regional multinational companies, you know, uh, be it the large retail groups or, or, or the large conglomerates in the region, they all have been evolving quite fast, right? And that's where the partnership with the banks comes in the picture, where they have been talking about not, not just the, the digital platform, but also about, around the liquidity structure, the cross currency pooling, the, the payment solution, the, 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 the collection. Uh, so all these things are fully integrated and that's what I have seen how the market has evolved. And I would say in the large corp corporate space, at least the corporates are ready to adopt and, and, and partner with the banks. Interesting. Um, you know, I keep reading in, in the current press, um, uh, there is such a significant renewed optimism after a dip in the moods and pessimism across. The PMI figure is well above 55 in the UAE. Uh, do all of you share this optimism? And what would keep you awake at night? Because uh, there's an old parad uh, old saying yeah, that bad accounts are booked in good times. Yeah? So I was just wondering um, if anything keeps you folks awake at night. Anshu, you want to take off? Sure, sure. So I think first thing first, I think the positivity is definitely uh, in and around all of us. And I think uh, when we talk to all of our clients, either in the corporate space or even in, in the retail space, I think the confidence level is much higher than what it was at the start of a pandemic. I guess uh, we are at a cusp where there are already green shoots, which are, I think, emerging uh, across the sectors. And if you talk of some pillars of the economy, whether it's real estate sector or even uh, oil at whatever price it is, right? 
uh, what we are seeing is that the real demand is coming back and these are the demand coming from let's say end users for example in the real estate space as averse to the previous cycles where we saw a lot of um, you know speculators and uh, flippers coming into the markets so that's just one part but i think overall uh, there is another uh, symptom which we we track very very closely in corporate banking is uh, the quality of the receivables which are sitting across the industry sectors and i think the very first questions which some of our relationship managers pose is that how is the health of your receivables i think it's that one question which addresses i i would say various key uh, you know points all across the economy and i think what we've observed is at least in the last uh, six months or so i think the quality of receivables is improving which also then defines the velocity at which uh, the funds will start to flow in and around the economy and i think that's a very very good indicator as well so yes to answer your point yes i think it's a positive thing uh, i think expo should definitely be another catalyst we can discuss and debate the quantification around that but clearly it is a move in the right direction i think a lot of uh, uh, things are being also done by the government itself right whether it's about the visa related swaps and then opening up the sectors for 100% uh, fdi in the country as well so all this put together will definitely help the confidence banks are flush with liquidity we are willing to support and lend we are willing to support to the new projects i think if the the corporates bring the right uh, business model and the right proposal i think it will be supported you also had a very follow up question on that uh, on what keeps us awake again i think uh, no new variant should again emerge i don't think we we all hate covid and we don't want a, a resurgence of that uh, uh, virus again uh, kind of uh, hampering all our economies and the global trade so i think that's the only thing which i am uh, quite concerned about so it's not in our control entirely but i think within the economy we are coming on the back of a very uh, i would say a stretched cycle even before corona so i think this is the start or we are at a cusp of a very positive business cycle and we should uh, all take this in a very positive way neeraj anything uh, that keeps you yeah i i i agree with anshuman right now if if you look at the market is cautiously optimistic right so and obviously there is a uptick in in the key sectors uh, but you know the recovery and its sustainability also to a large extent is uh, is as what anshuman was saying will also depend on how the global economy and the international mobility comes back to some uh, form of normality right because that's very important for ue Uh, from a ue economic perspective what keeps me or or the bankers awake i think probably it will be interesting to see next year when the central bank pulls out the support right how how the the market behaves right because obviously there would be certain segment which will be probably under stress and and how it will impact the, the entire value chain or the supply chain that we'll have to look at uh but one important aspect which will probably have a more longer term impact on the market would be if you look at you know at a macro level there is a supply chain diversification happening globally right and 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 companies are looking to reduce their dependence on on one country or, or one region now uae given its location i think probably can benefit it has its infrastructure it has all the logistics support and and the government policies i think which is going to help the economy in a longer run but in in near term i think probably we'll have to wait and see how market evolves next year once the central bank uh, you know support is pulled pull, uh, is pulled out my my take is somewhat more optimistic i guess so i would answer it in probably three ways one i think number one if you look at how uae in general and dubai has reacted to the pandemic i think dubai has been a winner or uae has been a winner whereas some of the traditional banking centers have lost out during this this point of time i think that point was also made in uh, in a different context uh, the second thing is if you look at cycles if you look at you know history you see that whenever there is a large dislocation in the economy and you go back to work after that the next between 5 and 10 years is going to be a period of building back and prosperity which comes from that economic activity the only question is timing you know is it already started in my view probably personal view yes probably it has uh, but some people may be more cautious about it as to the start of that and lastly if you think about just the liquidity point and i think neeraj also alluded to that that liquidity is so strong that i think may perhaps 
some of the projects are being funded today uh, or were being funded earlier that may not have necessarily should not have been funded. But I think the point when we will discover that is probably down the line, not today. Excellent. So op optimism all around. Um, uh, Mr. Salata, from your perspective, uh, you are exposed to banks um, across uh, Europe and the Middle East. Uh, what do you see bankers talking? So definitely there is an uptake when it comes to banks uh, getting back to investing, getting back to, uh, let's say, expanding their business. Because during the COVID pandemic, everybody was reluctant, right? Everybody was like keeping their money. They didn't know about the uncertainty. They didn't know what was, gonna to what was going to happen. So they kept all of their cash, let's say, as close as possible. They didn't make any risky investments. But now we see banks uh, doing more and more things that will push them forward. So I think that the, the time when the, the banks were mostly stressed is, is over now. And they are looking more forward towards uh, growing of the economy, towards uh, getting back on the market, towards investing, and with a much, much brighter outlook. And what we see uh, definitely in Europe is the uptake of uh, businesses related to factoring, to supply chain financing. So those are the areas that are definitely moving. There are more and more uh, participants in this area. There are more and more institutions providing such, uh, such services. And from that, we see that actually the economy is rebounding and the banks are more definitely more optimistic. Excellent. So talking about taking a cue from what uh, Anshuman said about receivables, you know, recently central bank decriminalized bouncing of checks. Do you see that as a positive for the lenders and the borrowers or do you see that as really not so positive? What are your views on this? I think surely positive. In fact, uh, this was one of our wish lists, right? Not, not now, but for the last many, many years. I think if experience tells us uh, what these checks do is they, they, they act more as a deterrent where even if there is a, a serious rescue plan someone has in mind, I think uh, uh, what takes precedence is to uh, leave the shores and then uh, go out and then uh, you know discuss about it. I think what bankers need today is a system where there is a sort of uh, an efficiency in a banker and a lender relationship which could come without this instrument. Of course, the process will become more robust, right? Where you will look at the entire business proposal you know, with a slightly better uh, set of eyes and more due diligence will be employed. But having said that, I think for the lenders, it also brings a lot, lot of confidence and conviction back, right? And uh, the confidence comes back. They don't really need to uh, think too much if the, the, the going is not in the right way. So again, I think as a banker, we've been demanding this, and I think it is a very, very positive step. Excellent. Uh, Neeraj, what's your opinion? Uh, considering yeah, you have I, a little I, exposure to Oman and Bahrain. Yeah, yeah, I agree, because if, if you look at it, it's a step in the right direction, right? It brings in the much-needed flexibility in the market. So we already had the bankruptcy you know, regulation, uh, though the precedence is being set up in the market. Uh, this brings in the flexibility in a way that the entire value chain can be a little more efficient and it allows the banks to look at the restructuring proposal in, in a more amicable manner. As Anshuman was saying, uh, you know, the, the, the lenders or, or the, the, the counterparties were using the checks more as a deterrent. Uh, uh, jail is, is obviously not the first step, you know, in, towards the amicable restructuring the plan. So this will bring in much needed help. The I think also that from the point of the uh, digital transformation, it also signals a shift away from the checks as a physical instrument, right? So the checks with their loss of, let's say, the checks losing power in this manner signals, uh, let's say it's a signal that uh, it tells the banks that it will be more and more about uh, digital payments, uh, more about some digital form of money being controlled, not using those physical instruments. That's, that's true. That was, that's true because banks are always debating because on the one hand, a check could bounce and you could suddenly everybody could rush into a criminal proceeding, but it's replaced increasingly by DDAs, right? Direct, direct debit authorities. If that, you know, bounces, what do you do? You know, so there was there were two laws for two different payment mechanisms. So in a way, I guess it's unified and it's, it's a, it, it is a very sensible step from the central bank's point of view. Um, my last uh, query, and uh, then uh, subsequently we'll try and uh, take the queries from uh, the participants, 
is, um, you know, we talked, I think Anshuman touched upon the onboarding a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, when corporate bankers approach customers, uh, and by the time the RM makes the first call, receives the financial spreads, it talks to credit, the entire cycle, the end-to-end -end cycle, till the limits are loaded on the system. Uh, there was a research at three banks, which I had witnessed, and um, they said that the average for the most efficient bank was 72 days, and another bank almost went to 170 days. Is there anything going around either on the artificial intelligence side, blockchain side, where we can shorten this process. Because the more you delay, the banker is deprived of the revenue, quite honestly, because you know the, the RM salaries are paid for those six months, the credit guys have been paid. And the customer too gets you know, credit much later. So I just wanted to have your views, uh, Anshu, Niraj. Karpin. Yes, I think um, if I may say this has been, uh, our Achilles heel for many, many years. And at least in the four banks, I have, uh, uh, you know, spent some time in the last 15 years. And I think it's very, very real. I think if we break it into three big pillars, right? The entire end-to-end -end credit cycle has first pillar where the data collection happens, right? The stage two could be your internal approval and uh, credit proposal writing process. And the third pillar is your documentation and disbursement. So I would presume that the first pillar is more of a two-way street and where we anticipate and expect our corporates to be giving us a quality information in the way we want right? rather than having too much of a to and fro. So that portion I will not comment upon. I think it's the second pillar, which has been uh, everybody's top priority and definitely in CBD, it is one of the projects which is currently ongoing where we are trying to, again, shorten this entire cycle from let's say today, uh, I could be sitting between 60 to 90 days, but again, the approach is to somehow bring it down to around uh, three to four weeks. So I think the aspiration is high. So what we are trying to do is break this entire analysis of the business model into two parts, the qualitative and the quantitative. I think that's the quantitative part, which can be actually entrusted to uh, the robos or let's say some of these AI predictive banking formats where your you know, spreads, your balance sheets, your ratio analysis, and sort of a prediction out of it can be entrusted to non-humans. And we only keep the qualitative aspect, which is you know, meeting the clients, understanding you know, some of those meetings which we do. So I think if we run this in parallel and we entrust the machines with churning the quantitative you know, part much faster, I think we can shorten this uh, tenure definitely. Of course, the third angle is also the, the documentation part and the entire legal chain, which also in most banks I have seen sometimes can run into days together, right? Because uh, so I think if we break it into three parts, attack all three in an isolated manner, I think uh, we can definitely shorten the, the entire end to end process. And, uh, and I can assure at least in CBD, we are making efforts to definitely bring it down. If not immediately to 30 days, at least to around 60 to 70 days end to end. Excellent. Thanks, sir. Neeraj? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if, if you look at the entire onboarding process, we can uh, split between the account opening to the credit approval process to, you know, the, the post-credit approval at the execution part. Now, typically, if you look at uh, the market players five years back or six years back, there was a clear difference between the onboarding cycle in an international bank where the compliance standard had become quite robust, or I would say probably a bit painful, you're driven by a certain, you know, guideline. And the local banks were more nimble at that stage. However, uh, international banks, the credit approval process was much more nimbler than, than the local banks. So if we look at, you know, market is moving towards the standardized approach and most of the banks are now aiming, as Anshuman was saying, a complete end-to-end -end onboarding cycle of around 60 to 70 days. I think where the AI can help is, is, is more around the cognitive analytics part uh, I don't think that probably in a corporate banking space, uh, AI will play to a large extent because the complexity of the corporate relationship is quite different. But uh, be it, you know, the compliance turnaround time, be it the onboarding, the account onboarding part, or some bit of financial analytics part, I think that's where the AI can bring in the much improved, you know, can bring in the turnaround time improvement. But otherwise, I think uh, the qualitative part will remain, you know, the domain of corporate bankers and that's where I think uh, the understanding of the, the sector and the nuances, these things probably can help uh, the, the banks to reduce the turnaround time. 
Is I also agree. Have you? Yeah. yeah, definitely. There is there is this thing about AI that it cannot help with qualitative analysis, just you as you have said. But uh, uh, Anshuman was talking about reducing the time needed to, that the clients are supplying the documents in different formats, not essentially what the banks need. And this is actually an area where I can help greatly because. When you train an AI model to recognize different types of financial documents, different types of uh, uh, data that is provided by the clients, it can actually provide you this e-reports that you want in the format that you need. So in this way to speed up the process, there are also multiple ways where the, the KYC data about the clients, like uh, the, the company's business information, the key stakeholders and so on, it can be also gathered automatically. In this way, reducing the, the time required for the initial KYC phase. Of course, after that comes the credit granting phase, which can also be helped a little bit with AI by, for example, providing some indicators about the, the industry, how the company relates to those in a way that would normally take a lot of time to analyze. So AI can also speed up with, with that as well. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that. Sure, what I have seen in, in my past life is at least two different, two further use cases. One is account monitoring from that perspective, using data to you know very quickly understand what is going on at the client's uh, side without necessarily waiting for the quarterly you know, submission. The other piece is um, you know, just estimating what, what the future needs of the client might be. You know, depending on that industry, depending on volume, you know, there's a lot of data that you can churn and, and predict sometimes, uh, sometimes reasonably well, sometimes not so well. Interesting. So, so splendid. I think we've covered a, 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 a lot of ground to the innovation that have taken place, the, what keeps bankers awake a bit at night, and uh, the onboarding process, uh, which really is beneficial both to the lender and the borrower. Um, I would like uh, the organization, the uh, Suchita, are we okay on time to take Q&As from the, pan, uh, the participants? Yes, yes, absolutely. We can uh, take Q&A. We've uh, received two questions in the chat tab and two questions in the Q&A tab itself. All right. So um, one is rather sector specific. Um, uh, this was a more of a broad seminar, but I'll uh, try and risk that. Uh, someone's asking about um, the banker's reluctance to contracting due to the recent jokes in this segment. Do you see the banker's appetite? That's a pun on word, I think, um, contracting for contractors. No, I think it's, it's a very topical question for sure. And uh, definitely, I think whenever there is an episode uh, in a certain sector, the reaction is obvious. And I think uh, people who've uh, been in the region, they would know that. Uh, but having said that, I think what we are thinking is that contracting per se has gone through a downward spiral, not just because of this last episode, probably, uh, which our participant is alluding to, but I think in the last three to four years. So I think uh, at some stage, the maturity and consolidation was always expected, which I think has happened. Uh, uh, on this particular instance, yes, most of the banks will again go back to the drawing board and see if there is anything else needed to be done. But I can definitely share, although I don't handle contracting as a space or a sector, but there is a very uh, senior level uh, meeting happening with all the stakeholders, with the government uh, counterparts involved, where uh, the, the aspect around invocation of the guarantees is being revisited. So I guess it is more of a trigger, which starts from calling of a guarantee. And then, you know, we have a very uh, impactful cascading impact on the entire ecosystem and going uh, onwards to the, the subcontractors, the, the vendors and everyone. So I would say this is a small nig which is impacting, but overall the industry remains uh, an important part of most of the banks and banks will definitely come back and support this uh, in the near term. Excellent. So, so a little bit of caution is being exercised, but uh, you're optimistic otherwise. Okay. Um, there's a query uh, by Tarek which says that when is open banking expected to take off in UAE for corporates and SME? I, I think if I, if I may, I think uh, the question sure. is difficult to answer because takeoff can mean different things to different right. people. But if you think about it, I think the, the foundations for that are being laid by the regulator the foundations for that, at least, you know, Mashrek Bank does have an API platform already. 
So there is work happening on that. The question is, when do you start seeing people, you know, creating solutions out of the API platforms and uh, and that becomes a regular sort of feature rather than something which is uh, new and fresh. I suspect that is not too far. Okay. And, and, and just to add, sure. Yeah. Just to add, uh, I think most of the banks have been going through the, you know, IP transformation program and API is a key for, for them to collaborate in terms of offering new services to the bank because they know uh, that the, the fintechs uh, have the capability to disintermediate some of the, the market pieces. And that's why the banks are open for that API part. But again, it's going to take some time, you know, before it evolves fully. Definitely. The regulations help here. I can, I can say it from the European point of view that PSD2 has accelerated uh, open banking and it has uh, helped to standardize, right? When you have banks that are developing their own solutions based on their own APIs, this is not something that is consistent across the market, which makes it possible, of course, to do open banking, to do multi, multi, bank, multi banking account management, but it's a little more difficult uh, unless you have this harmonized, uh, uh, let's say, approach to API so that the, 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 the banks are actually some kind of enforced to follow the standard that is, that is there. So when we see such regulation coming, I think this will be the time when the, the open banking will be blooming in the UAE. Interesting. So there is still some work, but it's not too far off. Um, this is a very old question, but it keeps coming up. Um, on IFRS 9 um, and the need for digital transformation to address some of these challenges uh, on perhaps unexpected loss, et cetera. Um, Anshman, would you like, Neeraj, would you like to talk about a little bit? Let Neeraj take the lead. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, actually we know that uh, the central banks have certain guidelines and then there are certain international norms around the IFRS 9, right? Now, unfortunately, this is more of a regulatory norms the banks have to follow. Uh, but as we speak, you know, things are evolving. You know, the regulators are conscious of uh, what changes to be brought, uh, you know. And, and we will see how it changes because obviously uh, the IFRS 9 mechanism over the last two, three years have an impact on the liquidity, I would say, you know, in terms of banks' ability to support the customer because you start a project say today and there is a deterioration one year later or two years later um, and you move from stage one to stage two obviously the ecl numbers and all those things can change and if you look at the last one year pandemic situation right now once the central bank uh, support is pulled out we will have to see at the industry level what percentage of stage one account shift to stage two or even to stage three and that's the number that we'll have to look at right so yeah. it is it is something which has an impact on the industry, uh, but again, the, these are more of a regulatory norms. Yeah, and, and, and I think any regulation like this, where in capital adequacy and uh, where the central bank has to kind of walk a tightrope into systemically supporting and ensuring that the banks are not stressed with better regulation, which may in the short term have an impact on a few individual borrowers because suddenly your cost of capital goes up and your pricing on the asset goes up a little bit. But I think in the long run, it's more beneficial to the economy as a whole. Uh, and I'm sure um, uh, that uh, little nickel in pricing can be worked out. I think we've taken most of the questions. Um, unless there are some any more coming up, uh, there was... Somebody is asking a rather unusual question. Um, do you see banks in the region monetizing data? Do you see regulators coming in on open banking? And that's been answered. Um, banks monetizing data is an awkward one. Uh, I don't think it happens, but if anybody would like to take that. No, miss. The data privacy is, is very, very important. True. You know, regulatory aspects. I don't think... Uh, Data monetizing is something which can be possible, but what bank will be looking at using the data to service the customer uh, much better, you know, in terms of the product proposition or the service standard and, and collaboration with the, the fintechs and a few other market players. But, uh, but the data privacy will remain a, a key feature for, for the industry. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, for instance, um, in, in, in the US now, there is like the IASB, there is an SASB, which is a Sustainability Accounting Standard Board that has come about. 
actually it's been around for a while. And one of the key reporting requirements there is losses and breaches on data uh, security. And hence, I don't think this monetization of data, I mean, it's, it's too, first of all, small for a bank to even go there. And um, I don't think ethically it even happens. Uh, if there are errors, that's a different story. But no, to answer your question, that really isn't um, uh, happening at all. Um, so somebody has asked a question and uh, perhaps that's uh, maybe the second last question we can take and that's to Mr. Salata, I suppose is that, is a question of bio lease, right? The perennial question, should the bank invest in their own IT systems, particularly the mid-sized banks, you know, the HSBC, the cities can, have enough room to amortize those costs over a long term. But the mid-sized bank, should they invest in their own in-house platforms or do you need to white label these? So this is definitely a trend. And we see banks like CT, HSBC, BBVA, they are doing a lot of their own development. Basically what they are becoming are standalone software companies. So it's not, not, about, uh, not about, let's say banks facing the competition from fintechs, but banks becoming fintechs. Because uh, only the, I think only the biggest banks at this point who want to service the whole portfolio of different products, traditional products, and not have a narrow niche like a fintech, only the ones with the biggest budgets can afford to have this self, uh, let's say self-governing IT, IT departments that are developing all of, the, all of their kinds of software. Because from our perspective, mostly the, the, the software that can be bought from different vendors on the market uh, gives you the most bang for your buck because it already has those processes embedded. It can be, of course, customized. And only if you have like the, the very big budget, only then you can think about, and you are working essentially globally, then you can think about uh, making a profit out of, let's say, developing your own solutions. Uh... I guess we've covered most of the questions uh, uh, that have been answered by a wonderful panel uh, covering various, I'm just quickly scrolling. Um, Suchita, do you have any other queries? Have we covered uh, the questions in the Q&A tab? Yes, those, those have been covered, yes. Okay, perfect. And I think we do not have, we just, got a question right now uh, on the chat. And I think we can keep this as the last question if we have covered everything else. Uh, which is that? Could you read that out to me? Is digital it's... onboarding for corporates SME possible? Ah. KYC hmm. and compliance restrictions in UAE requires eyeballing originals and face-to-face -face KYCs, especially for free zone registered companies. Salata, I see you smiling. Yeah, so definitely. This is a difficult point. This is where, yeah. uh, this is the point where the regulations, they don't get, are not caught up with the market yet. So uh, definitely uh, the parts of the, parts of the digital onboarding can be sped up by sending the, the copies of the documents, uh, uh, send the, the copies of the documents digitally. But still, if you need to have the originals, it would probably be wiser from the bank's perspective just to receive the originals, scan them, put them through the software. And uh, because of the regulations, right, it's not, not easy at this point. It's not, not possible to automate. We can automate part of the processes, but uh, still there are things that need to be done manually. So, so, so maybe the, 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 the United Banking Federation or the UBA um, needs to kind of raise this to central bank and maybe uh, be bold enough uh, and take legal counsel. Uh, so each individual bank doesn't waste money talking to their individual lawyer. If they can issue a gazette saying that, you know, uh, first of all, social distancing comes into play as well and RMs are not meeting customers that often. So if they can get digitized documents in some way, I mean, Adobe has digital signatures for quite some time. Land Department accepts digital signatures now. So, so if, uh, maybe yeah, so so, so actually just like there is already you know if you look at there is a blockchain KYC initiative uh, which has been rolled out in UAE and and many banks have signed up for that right now uh, what was mentioned earlier I think the benefit of that can be leveraged only when it becomes standardized acceptable within the market uh, but I think the initiative uh, is there already in in the market and I think slowly the banks will adopt to that. 
uh, interesting. This initiative is for few banks, or it's across under the? No, no, it is it is across the bank. But uh, initially, I think six or seven banks have signed up for that. Uh, but yeah. it has to be, you know, uh, standardized across the, the the market and the region. Okay. Uh, I think we just have two more questions very quickly. Uh, thank you all the attendees. I would like to inform you that these are the last questions that we'll be taking now. Uh, one of them is if you can share your view on fast payments and cross-border real-time payments. I would say faster payments are coming. Coming very soon. We are almost there. I, I think... Uh, the I think the key question to answer within that is that the retail side tends to move first and it's already there. And I think the wholesale side is moving there. And I think we are not that far away from uh, real-time payments like any other region or country in the world. Um, what was the other question? Yeah, so the last question is... Uh, yeah. I think same for cross-border as well. So this is definitely an area where blockchain can be of help when we are talking about uh, cross-border transactions, uh, international ones, because it allows you to essentially send money very quickly. Right now, it's not standardized. So this is something that needs to happen for the corporates to adopt it. But otherwise, I see it being definitely the future of faster payments, international ones. I mean, Ripple's trying that, uh, you know, with the RippleNet and, and, you know, other initiatives like that. I, I'm just not sure the liquidity to handle the kind of volumes that, you know, the corporate side generates yep. exists today. Yeah, at this point, yeah. Excellent. Um, All right. So the last question is digitalization and transformation is a challenging task in a bank. What is the best way to drive this and ensure all bank activities are being transformed? Based on your experiences, is this IT personnel driven or business unit personnel driven objective? And what is the best way to ensure this is implemented effectively and efficiently in a bank? I think this is open so, to all of you. So, so, so maybe I can just, um, you know, this is such a broad generic question. Uh, it's a classic textbook question. Now, first of all, digitization is not a silo in a bank, right? It is all pervasive. So it has to have the buy-in of the board. And digitization also does not come cheap. These are not band-aids that you use. I mean, maybe a few banks used to do it maybe 10 years ago, fix this, fix that. But that's gone. So the board buy-in definitely has to be there. And the fact that all banks have an IT division because you need a technical expertise uh, to can convert that to commercialise and speak to the user departments. So A, it's definitely not easy, but the likes of Salata, Karthik, and everybody will tell you that it's, it's, it's getting there very, very fast. So it's, 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 it's really the classic case of defining what you want, what the problem is, putting a team in place, monitoring it, fixing things as they go, keeping getting user interface uh, uh, feedback, and you know, occasionally keeping an eye on what competition is doing, and then these are these are the broad uh, stuff that uh, most banks do, and uh, you could all uh, share in that. No, no, I fully agree. I think uh, beyond uh, just the top dollars which you need to invest, and which is definitely uh, needed now because this is no more an option. I think it is needed, right, for you to sustain. I think the transformation part of this is more to do with the culture. I think uh, it is no longer a certain a department which will run it. I think every employee has to adopt it. So I think that talks about a cultural shift and that can be driven only by the respective businesses and the various departments. Uh, I think at the end of the day, there is a challenge that for every role which is getting digitized, that there is a redundancy on, on the human part as well, which is coming in. So there would be some pushback uh, and which is where you need to manage in a very smart manner. And that's called for a huge cultural sort of shift in every organization. There are definitely three or four models in this, and uh, perhaps it's easier to get going if you use a digital factory approach, which is a separate part, you know, cut out from the bank, and, and they start the, the transformation journey. But I would agree with Anshuman that, you know, as your, as your agile maturity is, you know, gets more and more embedded. Mm -hmm.
uh, they have to be part of you know one team and you have to manage it together because there's no digital business which is separate and there is no business which is separate right it's all one thing yes and it needs to start at the top right and just as I actually said it needs to start with the c level suite so they need to set the tone for the whole transformation of the of the bank uh, so that it happens organically so that it uh, is driven let's say consistently and only then you can have success when you have transformed all of those different units and the the organization's culture has changed true so I think uh, that brings us to the end of the, uh, I thought a very engaging uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, many more sessions coming in, but there were some wonderful takeaways. Uh, I like what Karthik said is it's really a dance with the customer. And uh, sometimes you have to lead the customer, even if you think the customer is not ready, uh, sooner or later they will be. Uh, there have been so many different um, improvements uh, that have uh, happened. Uh, uh, but overall, I think um, uh, also uh, every banker is sharing the optimism. I mean, each of you said that there is a real demand and not a speculative demand that is uh, being seen. And um, customers are getting more and more savvier, particularly on the corporate side. And, that, and there is room to shorten the onboarding process where AI blockchain technologies uh, can um, definitely help. And... Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think that was really, really informative. And um, I was happy to also note what Neeraj said about uh, there is already an initiative in uh, place for uh, using AI and maybe blockchain to, to enhance or the speed up the KYC process. And um, thank you, gentlemen, and all the participants for contributing. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Akshay, Neeraj, Anshuman, Karthik, Mache, for all your insightful thoughts on this pressing topic of the hour. We would definitely like to thank all our attendees for your participation, and I hope you really found this extremely useful and insightful. The webinar was hosted by MS Events in collaboration with Comarque Financial Services, who is a provider of state-of-the-art IT solutions for banks, insurance companies, brokerage houses, asset management companies, as well as investment and pension funds since the last 27 years. If you would love to know more about them, please reach out directly to Ms. Monica, who's the business development manager with Comark, and she has quickly joined us for a quick hello. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all your time, and we hope to see you very soon in our future events. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.